intersection of food, art, and social impact. So with that, um, I will give the panelists their own time to introduce themselves. If you'll tell everyone a little bit, a bit about yourselves and your background, I will pass it off to Preeti. Hi everyone, um, I am Chef Prithi Mystery. I have two restaurants now, both closed, Juhu Beach Club and Navi Kitchen. I'm also the co-author of the Juhu Beach Club cookbook. And I am currently living in Russian River in Sonoma County, um, writing, consulting, working and volunteering on small local farms and in the very early stages of hopefully one day building this beautiful dream I have of a BIPOC led farm and restaurant. So. Really happy to be here. Glad so many people joined us. Uh, yeah, I can go next. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Jocelyn Ramirez. I'm the chef and founder of a plant based Mexican food business here in Los Angeles called Todo Verde. And I'm also, which is currently not operating uh, the way that we usually do. We're mostly cater. We're going to sign our first lease in March for a restaurant. Didn't happen. COVID happened instead. Um, I also authored a, a cookbook that came out in April called La Vida Verde. It's a plant-based Mexican cookbook. Uh, and I'm also the co-founder of a nonprofit organization here in LA called Across Our Kitchen Tables. It supports women of color and food. And I am Aaron Hutcherson, based in New York City, where it is dark and I have not figured out lighting for nighttime <laughs> Zooms yet. Uh, I am a writer and recipe developer. Um, I also have a blog called The Hungry Hutch. And yeah, excited to be here. Awesome. Well, I'll dive right in. I don't want to get into a, a long conversation with anyone about like if appropriation exists or not. So we're going to just kick it off with our working definition of cultural appropriation tonight, and then we'll examine and break that down further. So today we'll be using the following definition of appropriation. The adoption of elements of one culture by another, especially in cases where a dominant culture exploits aspects of a minority culture outside of its original con cultural context and or at the expense of the original culture for personal gain. So in order to examine this further, I want to open up for the panelists to talk a little bit about the power dynamics behind appropriation, specifically what do you think are the inherent power dynamics that you find present during instances of appropriation and why does that matter? Why is that important for people to understand and recognize? And how have you also seen that play out? Who wants to go first? <laughs> I guess I'm going first. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I just say like, obviously, you know, as you were saying, Jenny, um, that's a great definition, thank you. Um, and a great place to start first of all. And I think that, you know, obviously the, the power dynamic is exactly what creates this rub, right? If people are just appropriating things from other people's culture, and like, if you just take those two words apart and say, oh, I'm appropriating this from someone else's culture, like, okay, so what? Um, but it, it's the power dynamic that makes it all uh, weird and not feel good. Um, and, and so it's that feeling of like, you know, I think about when I was a teenager and like, in the late 90s or early 90s uh and like chai became this thing in like every coffee shop and uh i didn't have the word at that time um but it didn't seem right you know what i'm saying like <laughs> i was sort of like what is going on here like this thing that like my parents and my grandparents drink every you know twice a day every morning every afternoon is now uh in every coffee shop and now I'm like working as a barista in a cafe and this like white woman general manager is like telling me what chai is. Um, and, and then, you know, all the things that come with that. And so like, for me, I feel like it's, it's that power dynamic of like, you know, I remember thinking to myself, like, why didn't we do this? Like, <laughs> we, we knew this all along. Like, why are we not making money off of this? Like, why didn't like some Indian people do this years ago? And it's like, as if chai wasn't being sold in Indian restaurants, of course it was. Um, but it's how the power dynamic can change, you know, the marketing and, and all of those things when it's in this very white space um, or just very sort of hegemonic space um, that the mainstream public feels comfortable with um, where, it then explodes and, you know, people start making money. Um, so I would say it's the power dynamic that actually creates uh, the entire sort of problematic nature of cultural appropriation. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just to echo what you're saying, I mean, in addition to that power dynamic, like you're saying, the, the money is a part of it, right? So it's like this intersectional layer of class. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you may have seen it in, in, you know, people of color's homes or in small mom and pop restaurants. Uh, but then when somebody actually tries it and thinks, I can make money off of this, the, mm-hmm. like the idea might be like, they're not doing it right. Like they're not, they don't have a whole marketing effort or the packaging isn't just right. But if I did it my way, then I'd Mm -hmm. make tons of cash off of it. And so it's definitely this like intersectional layer of like, like I can kind of like outsmart this, um, this idea that has already been created by somebody else's culture essentially. So it's just kind of a, a, you know, as Preeti was saying, it's like, you know, back in the day, we didn't really have the, the name for it. But it definitely had you feeling some type of way and it just didn't sit well. Right. Um, But you didn't really understand like why it wasn't right. Um, But now to see like how so many people have grown in sort of this like very capitalist system using recipes from, you know, a lot of people of color, a lot of indigenous people and kind of leaving them high and dry behind once they get what they need, that needs to definitely change. And sort of continuing on from that point, um, it's like, yes, some people may have had the idea to like turn this into a business, but they may not have had the capital or the resources to do so. Mm -hmm. But here the dominant culture comes in and they have the capital and the resources from historically putting down the other um, groups of people and cultures. And so that just is a, continuation of what they've been doing. It's like the dominant culture will sort of take from other cultures what they can um, and strip them of whatever resources they have and uh, their identity and their cuisines and things like that and then use it for their own personal gain and profit and fame and go from there. Whereas if someone from that culture tries to do that, they might have, but they not, they just, might not be able to because of resources and capital. I mean, or even just being a person of color, you know what I mean? Just, just very, like, even if they have the same resources and access to capital, but they're just a brown face saying this thing or bringing this good or service to the marketplace, uh, they're just going to be not respected um, in the same way than if a person from a dominant culture presents that exact same thing. And there's a lot of different types of dominant identities, like class is definitely one of them that can intersect with, even if you can be a wealthy person of color, that's very, very different from being a mom pop shop, that's a person of color as well. Um, Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask about what are the responsibilities then for, regardless of how we may feel about cultural appropriation, the sad reality is that a lot of big companies, people who have the capital are going to continually try and um, use and be inspired by use ideas from not cultures and backgrounds not out, outside of their own. So what are the responsibilities that come with the power if they wanted to go around and do something like that, if they wanted to be, you know, take on um, a, a new type of cuisine at their restaurant or try something in the CPG world, like, is there a way for them to properly do so? Is there a responsibility for them to step back and not and let BIPOC face the stage like where it's not mine? I mean, I think it's definitely important to let BIPOC take the stage in these scenarios. Um, It may be a partnership, you know, where there's a, you know, existing business that is bringing a new menu item onto their, um, you know, or a new menu item onto their existing menu, Um, but they have maybe consulted with uh, somebody in the BIPOC community and are, you know, kind of making sure that they uplift that person with whatever platform that they have available to them. Um, you know, that's something that I've, I've seen a little bit more of, um, but it's also very important to make sure that these folks get paid, you know, because uh, sometimes people are quick to say, especially like big companies are quick to say, oh, well, you know, we're going to, you know, partner with you in exchange for exposure. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like, really, that exposure is not paying my rent during COVID times, you know? I need actual, you know, funding for something that you are going to capitalize on in the long run, because folks know our, like, you know, 
POC food is good. Um, and, and people want those flavors and they are trying to kind of, you know, make sense of the situation, but it has to be really intentional. And like one thing that we talked about is like, um, in our pre-call is, um, you know, making sure that people understand that it really takes time to build these relationships. It can't Mm be, I'm just going to use you for, you know, our second quarter new recipe. And sure enough, by third quarter, you are long forgotten. This has to be like a, a relationship that's being built, uh, a community essentially that's being built. And how do you uplift folks in that community for the long term, not just for your personal gain in a short period of time? Jocelyn, you yeah. also had a, uh, a story. I was wondering if you could share about Renee oh. and his research efforts. Yeah, so we, we talked about this on our pre call as well. Um, many of us know Rene Redzepi. He's one of the most famous chefs in the world uh, from Noma. And he was here in Los Angeles doing a book signing at a local small bookstore. And I know the owners and just waited till the end so that I can just kind of sneak in at the end, get my book signed. And when I approached um, him, he was like, oh, I know you. I, I totally know you. And I was like, uh... I don't, I don't think so. Uh, Cause obviously I know I have never met the dude. Right. Um, and so he kept insisting we, he went on to sign my book and then he says, Oh, I remember where I recognize you from. Uh, you were one of the, the companies, the businesses that we researched before in Mexico. Um, our, our, our whole, uh, I forgot what he called it. Like our whole like art project and yeah but he didn't call it a pop-up he called it like our artist thing or like an installation yeah oh my god yeah amazing (laughs) and and he's like yeah we researched all about your your company todo verde before we went out there and at the moment I thought oh that's that's really interesting and cool and like you're this you know very famous chef and I'm just kind of getting my business off the ground Um, And then it just made me wonder afterwards, like, what did, what exactly did they research? Did they look at, you know, my food and my recipes or like, what did they get from what they researched? And how come I never heard about it? They never reached out to this day. We don't have any sort of relationship. Um, And so me, it it just kind of, again, left me feeling some type of way, Um, you know, like I kind of want to get to the bottom of it, but it's kind of like, okay, I don't know what to do about that now. It's just, it is what it is. I, I had a food truck company like culinary director come with his whole team to my restaurant and basically order every single thing on the menu like they run different you know types of food trucks of different cuisines and he just like straight up blatantly said it to my face like <laughs> they're here to taste everything on the menu and like analyze it and I was just like okay <laughs> what am I, I can't do anything. Like this guy works for this company that has all of this money to like create all these food trucks. Like what am I, I have my 40 seat restaurant in a strip mall. Like, okay, (laughs) but there's nothing you can do. Yeah. I also had somebody who attended one, because now I'm doing online cooking classes. And uh, there was this woman who took the class, a white woman from San Diego. And literally towards the end of the class, she unmutes herself in the Zoom and was like, hey, I am, uh, I work at a restaurant in San Diego. I love this recipe. And I just want to know, is it bad if we start selling this, uh, this on our menu? And I was like, "Uh, can you send me an email? Because I can do consulting with you. Like we can talk about stuff, but you can't just like, take my recipe and just start. Obviously, the way that she started saying, is this bad? is already for me an indicator (laughs) that she already knows that it's bad. Um, But it's just such an interesting, weird world of food sometimes. Mm -hmm. And with that, like no one can really own a recipe or cuisine or anything like that, just based on like actual laws, you can't own that. Mm -hmm. Um, But there is, I think the right thing to do is at least, credit the sources if you were inspired by something or someone Mm -hmm. or if you're going to go and outright steal a recipe then you should pay someone for that time and effort in some way um but yeah definitely that's just like a blatant outright theft (laughs) like oh i'm gonna take this recipe and use it um but 
sort of when where it gets murky is like oh i went to this restaurant i ate this dish i i'm going to try and make something inspired by these flavors um whereas like i don't know the outcome of the food truck people that came to your restaurant preeti but like if they you can't try replicate, to replicate this. it <laughs> <laughs> it's like if they try to replicate One it exactly, time, baby. <laughs> then that's an issue but if it's like oh i want to do something similar then sort of where it's yeah. hard to sort of draw the line of inspiration and appreciation versus outright theft at that point i think i totally agree and i think that like i mean that's the point is like we all are inspired by our experiences like we all like you know that's why we all talk as chefs we you know in the food world about traveling because we want to like taste all these different flavors and see and experience all these different things like there's nothing like inherently wrong with being inspired by the cuisine of other people um I think it's like even just like if you're like in terms of the recipe I think you know if you're actually going to blatantly just use somebody's recipe as opposed to like oh I'm inspired by this like one thing like oh this person you know used a lot of vinegar in this like pepper and nada like hmm yeah I like pepper and vinegars like whatever whatever the thing is like you can be, we are all inspired by those things but like if you're actually just taking a recipe without giving credit or like you're of a dominant culture and you're like learning stuff that you know that basically acknowledging, if you can acknowledge it with yourself that you're doing something that the people of this culture might not have the privilege to do. I think just like acknowledging that to yourself and then thinking about like what you're saying, Jocelyn, like the fact that this woman's like, is it bad? It's like, <laughs> she's starting to go down that path of like, wait a minute, this is more complicated than me just being excited about this recipe or this particular cuisine and making it and making some money. Like I need to slow my roll. I think that in anything, it's really just like, if you just respect and acknowledge and think about what you're doing and, and the privilege you have and, you know, is it bad asking some questions um, you might like not step in doo-doo. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you also offend people and, you know, hurt people? Yeah. It, you know, one thing that I saw this past week, which is actually an old video from September that just somehow surfaced on my Facebook page. I don't go to Facebook often anymore, um, but it was Ina Garden and she was uh, making a pozole recipe. I don't mm -hmm. know. You can just literally Google her name, Facebook Posole, and you'll see the comment section, which is amazing. I love how my <laughs> folks came through and, you know, with the gifts and all the things. Um, but it was just like, what, like, what are people thinking? You know, uh, like, why can't you just use that same amount of energy and time and money that it took to produce that video and put a POC person there who like actually knows how to make that dish who can truly represent it who could gain so much from just having something from food network you know video made by food network up um but i think that people who are scouting talent are just so incredibly lazy um mm -hmm. like they only know who they know already mm -hmm. which are typically folks in the white community um or they might know like that one Mexican person. And now that they know the one Mexican person, there's like no use in finding anybody else who's Mexican because they have the one. When there's like so much regional cuisine of mm -hmm. Mexico and many other countries um, that truly represents the entire culture uh, and the country. And so, you know, I just think that it's, it's really time for people to kind of um, like, let it crack open like let folks kind of out of the box that you've created for them i feel like this is a little off topic but can i just say something about what you just said which is like i feel like so much of it is also this like cult of celebrity and this idea that like you know i mean it's like oh yeah there's that one song oh but did you hear the drake version like it's sort of like everybody just wants like that same person, whether it's the person of color, like, you know, I think he's a nice guy, but like, oh, Marcus Samuelson. Okay, we're done. <laughs> he will be the one, <laughs> like that sort of thing. And then when you have like Ina Garten or Bobby Flay or Rachel Ray, it's like, you know, people just want to see that person make pozole or 
chicken curry or you know whatever it is like they just want it from that person and and this idea that and i do think it's because media is lazy because i do think that people are actually like more dynamic than that like i think that people could actually americans people around the world could handle seeing different people that aren't the same like 10 celebrities make the food of every culture I also wanted to talk about one of the very visible forms of appropriation is like naming and just vocabulary, the word, the language that we put around the food that we create, whether it's named incorrectly or it's maybe named and then written about in a strange way that kind of has the white gaze, we discovered this, this is new, or it's just, you know, the name is translated wrong, whatever that is. Can each of you just talk a little bit about like how naming plays into appropriation, how you've seen that, what we can do about that? Um, so with that, from a media standpoint, a lot of it is thinking about who your audience is and how much work you want your audience to have to do to understand something versus how much you just give to them. Um, the first thing to come to mind is I think, I don't know if it was Bon Appetit or Christina Tosi or one of them, uh, were made up a recipe for like a flaky flatbread which <laughs> uh, is also paratha and it's like when you go around calling this flaky, flaky flatbread you sort of strip it of its identity and its history and its place and its people and its culture to make it palatable to everyone else to outsiders who aren't from that culture and mm -hmm. so that is I think for the longest time, mainstream media has focused everything towards a middle-aged, white, Midwest, sort of suburban persona in terms of what they know and what they don't know. That's sort of like the lowest common denominator. Um, and I think that by doing that, then they just never, no one ever learns. No one gets better. No one learns the actual name for things. And we are just stuck with this like, oh, this is a flaky flatbread that I love. <laughs> That's delicious and tastes good. Um, and so it's just, it's a laziness that is on behalf of the writers and editors and media as a whole. Um, and they also treat their readership as lazy. It's like, oh, if I call it Paratha, then Mm -hmm. They won't know what this is and will think it's like something completely foreign Scary. or whatever, <laughs> scarier, new or too exotic um, <laughs> for them to want to make. Uh, so that's sort of the issue as I see it when it comes to naming things. And um, a lot of times media will try to make it translated into a way where it's like easily understandable and easily digestible, pun intended. Um, but I don't think we have to do that anymore. I think we need to educate the consumer and also push them to like do some of the work to be better and learn more. And it's okay if you have to look up something every once in a while, Go to, Google is your friend. <laughs> like, what is this? Then you can look up a video or whatever. Yeah, I have a story on the other, on the flip side of it in terms of taking it back, which is that, uh, when I was opening um, my restaurant from a pop-up to brick and mortar, I really wanted to have a Indian scotch egg. And um, I was doing all these trials. And meanwhile, my brilliant wife was like Googling the fuck out of everything and ostensibly discovers <laughs> through the internet that it seems very probable that Indian people created the scotch egg. Um, there's a recipe called Nargisi Kofta from that predates uh, the Scotch egg from Fortnum and Mason by a century. Um, and I think we all know that the Brits were all up in India. Uh, <laughs> so uh, when we went to name it, so I was like, wow, this is amazing. And so then we decided in that moment, like we're not gonna call it, uh, you know, Indian Scotch egg or lamb Scotch egg, um, which was what I was gonna use anyway, but we were gonna call it uh, Nargisi Kofta. 
um, or lamb kofta. And that even if that didn't have that like immediate, like, oh, a American person knows what that is. Cause I also as like someone who's Indian, but like grew up my entire life in, you know, the UK and the United States. Like I have that gaze. I was, you know, culturally brainwashed by television and movies and all of the things uh, to like still have that tendency to like make it cute or, you know, do this, whatever. Uh, give it that name that's somehow digestible. Like we self-censor ourselves. Like, you know, I'm queer. I've been fucking self-censoring myself for decades. Um, <laughs> like it's, 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 we have to like kind of unlearn it ourselves. I feel it sometimes as well. And that was like a really great moment for me to kind of like learn something of like, oh yeah, let's just call it what it is. Because, and then if someone would say, oh, it's like an Indian Scotch egg, I'd be like, actually, in fact, I said this to Mr. Anthony Bourdain, um, actually, we invented the scotch egg, and he was like, yes, ma'am. Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> I love how both of you also talked about just like, how do we uncenter the white gaze? How do we uncenter just the whiteness in food? And I think a lot of times when we start talking about cultural appropriation and food, the conversation gets derailed really quickly to be about like white fragility and white worry. Like, does this mean that white people can never cook anything from another background? Does this mean that, you know, it's all about like, what is that this limitation gonna be on me? So today I want to consciously like shift away from that and talk a little bit about like how cultural appropriation actually affects BIPOC people. And just starting with why is it harmful? I feel we don't even talk about why it's harmful. We just assume it's like, theoretically bad, but why has it impacted you? How has it shown up in your personal life, your professional life? Like, why has it been an obstacle for you that we are still working through as an industry? I can start this off a little bit. You know, one of the other things that we had talked about was just like, you know, me growing up watching and being addicted to like cooking shows growing up, one of them being Rick Bayless's Mexico One Plate at a Time, which was you know, in one sense, really awesome to see different regional cuisine featured because I was so focused on my family's regional cuisine of Zacatecas, but then also to, you know, on the other end of it, think this guy is taking up space where there should be somebody who I can, as a young person looking at, looking up to somebody in the food industry, should be able to identify with somebody on the screen. And I just didn't see that. So you know, even growing up, I always thought that food was something that I was really passionate about, but never thought that it was a career choice for me because I didn't see myself, I didn't see a space for myself there. I just thought, you know, I'm, I'm, that's something that I'll always want to be into, but it's not going to be what I end up doing for a living, um, which is just so sad to think about like how you can really like frame somebody's mind to think that you know, this is really like a, a, a dominant space for white men, essentially, right? Um, to make all kinds of food that they learn typically from POC or BIPOC women. Um, and so it's just really an uh, unfortunate situation. I, I think for me, it's just, um, it just, it, it feels like a little bit, um, I don't know what the, what the proper word is, but the feelings are just kind of like upset, frustrated, um, trying to kind of like get people out of the way and really like be able to see the true essence of like where these flavors, this food and this, you know, technique comes from. Um, and in fact, you know, as Toda Verde has received a good amount of press over the years, uh, you know, people from time to time will ask me, like, who did you work for? What chef were you working under? Assuming that I worked for some white chef somewhere for some years before I did a spinoff to do my own thing. And I was like, I, I, the person that I learned from is my abuelita. That is my, you know, my true essence of like all the food technique and sazon and, uh, you know, everything that I needed to learn. Um, but yet that's still for some people, isn't enough. That's not, you know, chef worthy because I, I didn't have this like um, French training, which is another problematic thing to think about. Like the reason that, you know, the French have been able to kind of like dominate in the culinary space is because they were the first to document a lot of things, but that doesn't necessarily mean 
that their way is the only way. Their way does not really look at a metate, a molcajete, you know, all these techniques that my culture has created or, or used um, in the process of, of working ingredients as a formal technique to prepare food. So, you know, that doesn't really resonate with me 100%. Um, although it is useful, it's not something that, you know, I think that I have to go through in order to reach a level of like chefdom or whatever you'd like to call it, right? Um, and so there's a lot of problematic layers there, definitely. I think also there's this bullshit idea of meritocracy um, that so many people are uh, like brainwashed into believing that they think that somehow like, you know, well, you could do it too, but you just didn't. Um, or I'm somehow better or smarter, you know, with the marketing or packaging or whatever. When And, and when that's kind of put in your face with no, it, it's basically like putting it in your face with no acknowledgement of privilege and being like, yeah. yeah, I get it. I can do this, but you probably can't get away with this. Um, you know, it, it's, it's that idea that like somehow it's all just, well, it's all just food. And like, if I make this food and it's like tasty and people like it, and I'm a good business person and I'm good at marketing my product and then, then what's the problem? Um, because that, that infers the concept that somehow we have an even playing field in our society, which is just a ridiculous idea. Um, I think we can all acknowledge that <laughs> inequalities exist. Um, so like, I think that that's where it becomes problematic is like when, when somebody's called out or it's, it's just like, oh, well, I'm just being me, like you're being you, like you have just as many opportunities to do this as me and not acknowledge that sort of like, I'm in a position of power. I have the privilege to do this. And what I was saying before about the sort of acknowledging the privilege, like to actually acknowledge that. Um, I think about once I was chatting with some like industry friends that came in to dinner at the restaurant and we were talking and they were like Shea alum and uh, they're both white presenting. And uh, I was saying, we were talking about this whole notion of writing all the farm names on the menu and how it was kind of like going out of style. Like you don't really need to do that the way it was like, you know, a decade before or five years before, like the people are starting to trend down on that. And I was like, yeah, but I still have to keep doing it um, because otherwise people won't believe that I actually use, uh, you know, because I'm Indian and it's Indian cuisine, they, unless I list all of the small local farms that I use on here, they'll assume that I buy everything at Restaurant Depot. And they were both like, yeah, you're right. Um, and so like, just by acknowledging that they have the privilege to not have to do that because they're Shea alum and there's a lot of whiteness coming out, uh, et cetera, that they don't have that same burden to prove themselves because people just assume, or like the story I heard recently that uh, actually, I heard it a while ago, but, uh, that, but it was confirmed recently by somebody on Twitter that uh, Thomas Keller was using Hormel ham in his croissants at uh, Bouchon. Um, and like nobody would ever, ever, like they, they just assume he must be using the finest to find. And, and so I had said that I'd heard this a while ago and like a, a couple of former employees and people were like, yep. So like, it, it's just acknowledging the fact that you could get away with that kind of shit. Um, whereas we have to like constantly prove that we're like getting everything organic and we're getting everything from a local farm and we're making every little thing by scratch. And, you know, and then people still are gonna make like stupid assumptions um, if they don't read all the fine print we put on the menu. Yeah, I think it all comes down to, we live in an unequal world <laughs> where people of color and women um, have less opportunities, less chances, less capital to do the same things that white men can do with ease. Um, and so going back to the um, example that Jocelyn brought up with Ina making pozole, it's like she has that opportunity because she's Ina Garten, she's famous, she has a platform. But if some and I'm assuming that she did not grow up eating pozole. She had to learn that from someone. She had, she had to do research. Mm -mm. <laughs> oh, that's just wrong. <laughs> oh, but she had to part. like get this information from someone else. 
Whereas there is another chef out there who just knows this inherently in and out and could have been given the opportunity to have a video with Food Network, but now that opportunity is gone because mm -hmm. Ina took it. So that's where the harm comes in. It's that cultural appropriation takes away opportunities from Black and Indigenous people of color. And those opportunities most often equate with money. So mm -hmm. they're stealing. Or could Ina have had a person who knows how to make pozole on the show with her? Um, and mm -hmm. that also comes down to money. Would that person actually get paid? Um, oh, we don't have it in the budget. How about Ina actually just takes a little bit of that episode since she's, you know, leaning on this other person for all the intel? Like, would that be so terrible? <laughs> yeah. Aaron, can you also talk a little bit about how this plays out in the blog world and like what blogs get the traffic, what blogs get the sponsorship deals, like how and how that we, I think there's a very specific demographic that we often see in blogging mm -hmm. and it's not particularly um, representative. Uh, so I've had my blog for 11 years. So I started around the same time as people like Smith Kitchen and others and probably even Reed Drummond and all these other people who are household names essentially. Um, and from the beginning, they would get these write-ups and traffic and everything and I never really got much of that until this year <laughs> after this year that we've had. Um, and this goes back to my earlier point. It's like in the blog space in particular, a lot of it is white Midwestern housewives who have the time and the opportunity to put all this energy, all their energy and resources into creating this blog. And then they get written up by various outlets and their platform grows, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas there's people like me who like, I started doing it nights and weekends and never really got much of any press until the past year or two. And like, I'm just now starting to get some of the shine and sort of audience and clout that some of these other people have had for the same that have been doing it for the same amount of time that i i mean i'm not gonna make any judgment to anyone else's recipes or cooking but like i know what i'm doing i've been to culinary school i've worked in restaurants i have the culinary training i grew up in the kitchen um so yeah it's just interesting to see who has made it as like these blog celebrities etc and who hasn't um, and for Priti and Jocelyn, both of you have cookbooks. So can you talk a little bit about how that process and there's this weird, on one hand, you know, we don't, we don't want another Mexican cookbook. We already have one of those. And then on the other hand, it could be like, well, this isn't Indian enough for us because we have this random notion of what is supposed to be, you know, categorized as, as the ethnic cookbook. So can you talk about how mm -hmm. appropriation plays into there and how it causes harm? You wanna go first? Sure. <laughs> uh, I mean, back in the day when I first went plant-based, I looked up cookbooks, specifically Mexican plant-based cookbooks, and a majority of them are not written by Mexican folks. They're actually written by white folks. Um, and, you know, you see that now that I've now written a book and have kind of stepped into that world of authoring a book, um, you see that it's, a, it's very much a white space um, and that there's not a lot of room for POC there or... Um, or people want to again fit you in that box, right? Like, I, I knew that I didn't want to include the word vegan in my book because I wanted it to be more open to folks in my community who think that vegan is like too much, right? It's like a far extreme. And so plant based seems a little bit more flexible for people. And that was, I mean, I wouldn't say it was like a struggle to get that change, but there's just definitely like this um, imposing of like what they want and what they think will sell to folks in their community, but obviously I'm coming in to the scene thinking about what's gonna make sense for the community that I've already been working with for so many years. Um, and, and so it's, it's this collaboration that sometimes feels a little bit more like, you know, imbalanced. Um, 
but thankfully I was able to find something that, that like made sense for me. Uh, but I think it's just really important. Like one of the reasons I wanted to, to get this cookbook out there is because I feel like if there's going to be a plant-based Mexican cookbook, I want to be a part of it. I should take up space in this category. Uh, I should have room on that shelf. Um, and then in addition to that, I, I also want folks in the community to see like whether they're Mexican or from any other community to see that you know, these traditional recipes that my abuelita from a small rancho in Zacatecas, um, that her recipes could be published in a book where now there's people across the country and even some other places of the world that are cooking this food. Um, and that those stories that are, you know, written about each one of these recipes are super personal and important and relevant stories that resonate with a lot of people and that our stories matter, that it's not just about, oh, I, you know, I happen to visit this place in Mexico one time and now here's a recipe based off of my vacation like no this is this is like actual like family history um and that deserves to have space um for people to open up the book and and then to see all these folks like who are dming and commenting and like really sharing how much this book has resonated with them is so mm -hmm. important and i think that uh publishing houses you know once they you know, I guess are more open to having more POC take up space in these areas and actually see that, that the numbers show that folks are looking to buy these types of books. I think that that's really what's going to help create a shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when I was like first working on my book, my co-author uh, who's been involved with other books, um, but it's my first book. Uh, she kept bringing me all these Indian cookbooks. So one thing that we actually talked about before is that actually uh, most Indian cookbooks, American Indian cookbooks are written by Indian people, um, not white people. I don't know if it's because Mother Joffrey just like kicked it off in the like 70s and 80s and was like, we got this, don't worry about it um, <laughs> or what. But there's a lot of really amazing, talented uh, Indian cookbook authors in the US and the UK and India. Um, but she kept bringing me all these books and I was just like, why are you giving me all these books? Like this book is like, this is about me and Juhu Beach Club. Like it is not like all of these other books. Like they're super traditional. They're like, you know, these recipes from my grandmother. I'm like masala fries and pulled pork vindaloo sliders that taste like American Southern barbecue. Like, <laughs> but, so I just, I, you know, but she was right. So she was right. Um, when we went to go start shopping the proposal, um, those are the types of answers that we got from people where it's, oh, we already have an Indian book. And so it's always like there's one Indian book, um, you know, for every year, maybe, uh, maybe even every two or three years, every publisher will do an Indian book. Um, but they can't have more than one, no matter how vastly different they are um, in terms of the cuisine um, and the story. Like also, like, I think that the other thing that once they usher in, as you say, Jocelyn, like more POC, uh authors they gotta look inside the house because i think that that's where the other disconnect really is is around like you know as aaron you were saying about marketing and who that demographic is this sort of like midwestern white like person in their you know middle age uh like me i mean the middle age part not the other part <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> So, I, I mean, I think that that's so much a part of it as well. Like I got in a huge fight with my um, agent um, who is not my agent anymore um, <laughs> because she didn't, she disagreed that I should have my photo anywhere on the outside of the book, that it should just be a pretty pictures of food. And she kept saying how like, you know, like, you know, the chefs that are on their books, like that's not the message we're trying to, trying to telegraph. And I was like, okay, first of all, like, I'm not like Andy Ricker, like, <laughs> like, and also like my book was personal, like it's recipes and it's beautiful photos of food, but it's also like the story about like how I proposed to my wife. There's like wedding photos in there. Like it, to me, it just seemed totally disingenuous to not, you know, this says a lot, this communicates a lot with just one picture um, where, you know, somebody buys this pr book with pretty pictures of food on the outside and a quote from Anthony Bourdain and John Birdsall and, is like oh wow and then they're like ah <laughs> there's a lesbian love story in here black lives matter what's going on like you know like it just made no sense to me like it you know and but it, for them 
they're not thinking about like the outside of that book and the content of what's in it. They're only thinking about how do we sell this book and what is our positioning. And to me, I feel like my publisher, you know, I'm glad they published my book. Thank you. But like, I'm also like, you don't really understand me or how to get this out to the right audience in the right way. You just have this one way that you know how to do things. And so that's how you're going to do them. But it's not really reaching the audience um, or telegraphing the right things to the communities and people that would actually be interested in this. Yeah. And you just reminded me of like, you know, you saying like this, this photo t says a lot of words, right? Mm -hmm. Like there was, um, uh, this wasn't about the book specifically, but it was with the collaboration I was doing with a client where I had a picture that I sent of a, a cocktail that we made. And it was like a really beautiful cocktail. But like, if this was the square, right, of the rectangle of the image, it was like this much hand and like the cocktail was like mm. up over to the side. And they were like, why is that cocktail so over to the side? And you just see like this hand or whatever. And I was like, that is a beautiful brown hand. Like that arm and that hand is so important to me. Like, I mm -hmm. think that that speaks volumes, even though you can't mm -hmm. see the person's face, like, you know, that that's a POC person holding that cocktail. Mm -hmm. And like, for me, that says that the, the, it's not just about the food. It's about the people. It's always mm -hmm. been about the people um, and who you're feeding and, and nourishing and nurturing with this food. And so I really like took a firm stance on like, this is the image I want take it or leave it. Um, because for me, this, this message of like, it's like without words, it's just the message that you're putting out there of like, look at how beautiful this all looks together, the food and the people, you know? I also love that all of these examples are, a it is like overcoming harm that has happened to you and making sure that the message that you wanted comes out into the world. Um, so with that, I also wanted to ask about in many times when you're dealing with appropriation, personal or professionally, however that's manifested, there just harm is done. Um, and many of us, even POCs, even marginalized identities also can harm other people within the context of appropriation. So what do you do? What is the right steps to take to at least start thinking about to mitigate that harm, to overcome that harm, to, to learn from that harm that you perhaps potentially inflicted on someone else? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Aaron, <laughs> you want to take um, <laughs> Sure, I guess I'll start. Please. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll say that in terms of mitigating the harm, it comes back to like a lot of things we've been talking about already uh, in terms of like, do I give the proper credit to the people that X, Y, Z belongs to you. And if I do, am I, and like, am I getting financial gain from it? Am I sharing that financial gain with that person or that group somehow? Um, and just, am I being respectful? Am I using the right language? Am I using the right words? Like for me as a writer, I think very carefully and a lot about word choice and what I call something. And I want to sort of as best as possible always use like the correct word or use like and use words that mean something and like words matter. And it's important to make sure that when we're describing a dish um, and we're describing Paratha, like you can say it is a flaky flatbread, but it's also important to say that this is the name of the dish. This is what it is, instead of coming up with these pseudonyms and whatever. Um, so I think those are some of the questions that I tend to think about um, in my work, sort of on a daily basis of, am I crediting, talking to the right people? Um, am I sharing the financial gain with them if I can? Um, and then I'm describing and using the right terminology. Mm -hmm. And then another thing that we sometimes have to think about is, should I be doing this at all? Like, should I pass this opportunity off to someone else? It's like, oh, this is a great idea, but maybe you have to like do this sort of internal inspection. Like maybe I'm not the right person to write about this or 
come up with this recipe and share it with the world. I mean, yes, there is something to say for anyone using their expertise and their platform to educate others about a dish or cuisine or a person. Um, but there's also instances with like, there's someone else out there who can do this just as well as I could, but they're more connected with it and they know more about it. So why not have, give this opportunity off to someone else? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that that is huge, like passing off opportunities and also the, you know, any potential for financial gain should be split equally, right? Like that's all folks want is an equal playing ground, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like we're trying to like, take over everything. We just want things to feel more balanced. Um, I recently had a phone call with somebody who has a, a very huge uh, vegan blog, uh, probably one of the biggest ones out there. And it's a white man and he wanted to meet me to virtually on a phone call to talk about um, this new part of his blog that was going to be all about Mexican cuisine and how he had written this like really extensive piece on Mexican cuisine but that he was pretty sure that there were going to be a lot of errors in it so he wanted he was reaching out to me so that I can proofread it and I was like yeah I have a lot of time on my hands to just like proofread your stuff <laughs> about Mexican food thanks dude it, like for not offering to like pay me anything for my time not giving me any credit like I'm just like, what are people thinking? What mm -hmm. are you thinking? You mm -hmm. know, this is consulting. If you want to get into this world, hire us as consultants and pay mm -hmm. the price that it will take um, to do this legitimately and well. Uh, but until that happens, like there's no more free labor here. We, like we're tired. <laughs> this can't happen anymore. I think there's also like just having like this phrase has become very popular in the last seven months of like do no harm and uh if if one wants to really like embody that um like you should be thinking about that with everything that you're doing whether it's contacting jocelyn to proofread your and consult for you um or it like aaron you were saying about like the naming of things um that you just think for a second is this going to upset or hurt or offend somebody um, because that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to be excited about what I'm doing, about what I'm writing, about what I'm cooking. Like I'm not looking for drama. I'm not looking to be, you know, seen as a bad person or, you know, what have you, or a person who's doing harm. So like, I think about like, uh, I had this Indian spiced uh, Cracker Jack on my menu uh, called Daisy Jacks. They're delicious. Um, and I remember when we were naming them, um, I was like, wait a minute, Cracker Jack. This seems like a minefield. <laughs> <laughs> so I like did all my research to make sure that uh, it actually, the word Cracker Jack predated both terms, Cracker and Jack and the negative uh, pejorative connotations they came to have. Um, and so I was like, okay, and we called them Daisy Jacks and it was all good, but it's like, if you just go into things with that mental model of like, wait, I want to make sure that this isn't harming somebody. Like, I feel like for myself, like, especially being a queer person of color, like uh, it's only recently in my life that I realized that like, oh, wait a minute, I actually have some power that other people don't. And I've had to check myself and recognize that like, I can also do harm because now I have power. And it was like an eye-opening experience uh, to realize. And so I think that like, it, it's not like, oh, you know, I'm okay because I'm a woman. I'm okay because I'm this or that, or, you know, I'm not racist. Like, it's like, we all have the power to do harm uh, given our various identities. Um, and that isn't always the same. It's not like, oh, well, I grew up poor. Well, you're not now, so like, Let's focus on now <laughs> and the fact that you have more power and privilege, this, we you know, this person. Um, so I feel like that is like a really big part of it is just really just coming all the time with the mental framework of I'm here to like be excited about cooking and writing about delicious food and culture, but I'm not here to try to harm anybody. So let me just make sure, you know, take that time, as both of you have said, how people can be lazy, whether it's business owners or media 
and, and take that time to make sure you're not doing that. Yeah, and the onus is on all of us to do that work, to educate ourselves, to even get to the point where we think like, oh, this might be problematic. Like, so like getting to that point takes effort and work and it's something that we all need to do and to build that sort of right mental framework of just going about daily life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think all this kind of relates back to like, how can we shift power dynamics? Because you can't, I think a lot of conversations about appropriation or not wanting to appropriate, it's like, how do we, how do we fix it? We can't fix it until you've solved the underlying problem of unequal power. Um, one of the like nice examples I feel that I encountered recently is I was interviewing a, um, of the restaurant owner behind Sophie's Cuban. The, the family behind that restaurant chain is not Cuban, but they hired a Cuban chef and he owns part of the restaurant. And it's like making sure that there's ownership involved. There's a, like a power exchange there that was, I thought was like very poignant. Um, so as the last question of the panel before we open up the Q&A is what are ways that we collectively as the industry, as consumers of the industry can shift power dynamics so that BIPOC have more power so that we can work towards a, a place where we're not talking about appropriation, where appropriation is not, you know, this is not so harmful because everyone has the opportunities to pursue whatever they would like in the industry. I mean, I think first of all, people got to give something up, right? Like that's that's the ultimate thing. Is like that's the problem with everything in an unequal society. Is like there's these people up here who are like, you know, David Kinch is up here. Like, there's inequalities in this industry, and it's like, okay, so what are you gonna do about that? Like, you have benefited from it. Are you going to give something up? Um, and that's when people get real scared. You know, socialism, huh? Um, <laughs> affirmative action. Um, like, no, we want everyone to have the same opportunities we do, but we also don't want to lose anything. And I think that that's really the part that is, you know, super fucking hard for anybody to wrap their heads around right now. It's just like, you know, and realizing that you have power and privilege and being willing to be Ina Garten and say, I'm bringing this person on to make pasole and they're going to get half of my, you know, salary for this episode um that giving something up giving up space giving up money um giving up opportunities to like open the door wider and give other people opportunities for stuff that you know beyond just exposure is just what i'm saying i 100 percent agree with that you know i think you said it perfectly and i think that also the also lots of acknowledgement, right? Mm -hmm. um, I really like the, the, what Jenny was just talking about, that Cuban restaurant and giving the Cuban mm -hmm. chef ownership rights um, to allow people to feel like worthy and accepted and proud uh, to be a part of this industry in a way that feels more meaningful. Um, and I think that, you know, the way that you do that and you achieve that is like, as Felipe is saying, giving up something that maybe is like a, you know, super lush comfortableness um, where you might give up something that in the end, you don't even realize that it's gone. It didn't really matter. Um, and in exchange, you are gaining somebody else's happiness. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just, uh, it's, it's something that all of us need to work on in this capitalist system, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, and then as consumers, we have the right to hold whoever these companies, media companies, celebrities, et cetera, um, hold them accountable for what they're doing and what they're saying. And we can speak up. And when we go and are looking to patron certain restaurants or consume certain media, we can also speak with like our dollars and our page views and our clicks. It's like, oh, I wanna learn how to make pozole. Like, I mean, yes, Anna Garden has a recipe, but you could also, Jocelyn probably has a recipe too. It's like, or is there someone else out there who has a recipe who is more, it's, they're more familiar with it and they, that, they have that ownership with that cuisine and that culture. And then just by clicking on it, that helps them. Mm -hmm. 
Well, with that, I'm going to open it up. We have a lot of questions in the Q&A, so um, I'm sorry to everyone who we don't get to your question, but I will try uh, my very best. We have a, a great follow-up kind of question to what you were talking about, Erin, um, and that is on accountability. So how can we make people, how can we make sure that people are held accountable for cultural appropriation? For example, there's a small chain of Mexican restaurants owned and run by a white man called Illegal Pete, which is very problematic. The question is from Lou Bustamante. Oh my goodness. I don't even know how to, what was the beginning of that question? I just got <laughs> sidetracked on Illegal Pete's. Uh, how do you hold someone like that accountable? Wow. Uh, I mean, honestly, we're at a day and age right now where right now there's a lot of cancel culture, which I don't necessarily agree with. You know, we saw it more recently with like Goya, for example, getting uh, canceled by a lot of people with their, you know, praise of, of Trump. Um, it's, it's, I think that people need to be open to listening to what the community wants and needs and being open to changing their name. Like we just saw Thug Kitchen um, mm -hmm. announcing that they are going to, I don't know if they already did actually change their name to something else, but that I know that they were working on it. Right. Um, like we're kind of living in a time where it's like, these things are not okay. Like companies are changing their logos. Like, you know, NFL teams are changing their logos and their mascots. Like, how is it that we're in 2020 and people are just starting to realize like, Oh, wow. Like, you know, this is actually not good for people. Like, hello, wake up. You know, <laughs> you've been sleeping for a long ass time and it's time to wake up. Um, and so I think that people need to be open to making that change and it's going to cost money and time and it's going to be difficult, but it's just what needs to happen. And in the end, this might even help that person's business by being open in that way and maybe engaging in a community dialogue of like, what should we name this, you know? It, and yeah, that's frustrating, but it totally needs to change. Yeah, and I think in terms of like what to do, it's up to us or whoever this person is to speak up about it. Mm -hmm. um, you can start, I mean, you should tell this business owner like, hey, this is wrong, this is why but then also telling other people in the community um, because this, I don't know, this reminded me of the sort of Portland taco truck saga from a few years back mm -hmm. of the two white women who went to Mexico and peeked inside of people's windows to see how they were making tortillas um, when they tried to ask them and then the women said no we don't want to tell you but so they literally looked in their window and stole their intellectual property um but like without someone speaking up and saying something about it then no one would have known so it's about using your voice to um start the process for change yeah i would also say like before like the first thing is to talk to the owner right like send them a private message send them an email give them a phone call and say hey do you realize this is problematic because like as you're saying jocelyn like i don't agree with the term cancel culture i think that you know it only became cancel culture when people in positions of power started getting canceled um before it's just been systematic whatever blacklisting um <laughs> but uh to me it's like yeah give that person an opportunity to like acknowledge that it's not right and consider changing it. And then if they're an asshole, then you put them on blast. Like, you know, because if, if, if I mean, I, I don't know, where is this person? Where in the country are they? But I'm just like, if, if you, obviously the name is incredibly problematic. So you are not the only person in your community that does not like this and is unhappy about it. <laughs> so like, yeah, I mean, I think that I mean, the, how does this person be accountable? Like the first thing is acknowledge that it's not right and change it. And then if they don't, then like, yeah, boycott the place, boycott sales. We also have a question from Helen S. Um, as a POC based in Australia, where the food landscape is filled with lots of culinary influences from surrounding countries, um, Vietnam, Thailand, China, et cetera, fusion food is everywhere. However, I feel terrified of creating new fusion recipes 
even though I'm a minority. Um, uh, let's say a Vietnamese inspired recipe. I'm not Vietnamese, but I grew up in this country that celebrates authentic and, in, and inauthentic fusion Vietnamese food. Um, so how can I write fusion recipes about food that I love without offending people? Hmm. I mean, as the person whose food has been called fusion before, um, <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, I think that the first thing you start with is like acknowledging what you know and don't know and being honest about that with people reading your work, like, or if you're cooking something, like just being real. Um, I was giving an example to these lovely folks uh, in our pre-call about, uh, I had a recipe in food and wine last year that was um, a, a Thai inspired recipe um, because the story was about um, chefs on their travels and things that they cooked or were inspired by and this was something that like I had gone with my friends who were living there to the market I bought a bunch of stuff we made we steamed some fish with aromatics and like just saying like being clear on what you like I mean I don't believe in the word authentic but like uh just being clear about what you know and what is your expertise and what you're like well I was just inspired by this Vietnamese dish and I'm not saying that this is traditional. I like that word better than authentic. Um, it's not traditional, but this is sort of my inspiration based on you know the food I ate at such and such restaurant or when I traveled to Vietnam or what have you. Um, and just acknowledging all of the things that you don't know and you're not an expert in, but you made a delicious recipe and you hope people like it. We also have a question from Next. Leah Shu. Um, <laughs> What is the person perceived to be a privilege for the sake of conversation, um, using her as an example, she says, um, I do research on the ingredients and recipes, uh, reach out to BIPOC relevant to my vision, but they are not responsive or they hate my idea, don't want to be involved or discourage me um, from doing it in a, in a non-helpful way. Does it make it okay for me to proceed with the vision because I tried? how would I convey the efforts I made to my audience, not just the BIPOC group who might have inspired me, but to everyone. Um, a lot of people who want to be better and woke um, would want to be, she thinks would be more apt to order for my cafe if they knew I, I at least tried and did the research. Uh, I would encourage that person to keep trying, like if a few people turned you down, like keep having conversations, that means that you're, you don't have true connections with these folks. Like they're not your friends. They're just randoms that you're just calling upon to, to try to get, get an okay from. Um, and, and that's really where it takes time, right? It takes time to build relationships with people who are, you know, willing to kind of share some of that history, that knowledge, that food culture with you. Um, it's not just like a, I sent an email and I got a negative response and that's it. I tried and let me just move on. It's like, well, you know, let me continue to, to like meet people. Like who's in my immediate circle? Like a lot of times I like to ask people, like look around in your immediate circles. And if everybody is like of the same background, um, what are you doing to kind of make sure that you're being inclusive of different people, that you're inviting people to your table, so, so to speak, right? Um, to like participate in your life and the work that you're doing. I don't know. I feel like that's, that's still like some work to do. That's what I think. We also have a question from Adrian. Um, how do you acknowledge and confront colonization relationships? relationship with the foods we love and now associate with certain cultures. Do you inform patrons or staff about those histories? What kind of language would you use while doing so? Like a lot of the things that she loves, like banh mi or um, Hong Kong milk tea are byproducts of white colonization. And sometimes I feel a certain kind of way um, eating it, even though it's delicious. Well, do Vietnamese people make it? Like, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't really see a like colonization and globalization, um, both one more traumatic than the other, um, are in every facet of our world, right? So like, I mean, when my mom grew up in Mumbai, there was no such thing as a Frankie or Kati roll, but now there is. And I'm sure some person in India was like inspired by like a burrito and was like, 
oh, we have these flat breads. Let's like, we could do this. <laughs> um, like, I think that all of those things exist. Like the reason so many dishes exist in our world is because of migration, uh, whether it's in a brutal, violent way like colonization or um, in some less, you know, oh, in Provencal, the food is more like Italian food and in Alsace, it's more like German food. Like all of those things are, exist. Um, I don't think it's really, I don't know, to me, I, I don't see the banh mi as like indicative or even chicken tikka masala. Like I don't see that as somehow this symbol of like this negative thing. It's almost like this thing was really negative. We all agreed, but look at this delicious thing that came out of it. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, to me, that's, that's, that's what I would say. And then it's really, who's, who are you getting the banh mi from and who's profiting from that? Yeah. I mean, I talk about decolonization quite a bit in the work that I do. Um, mostly thinking about, you know, the, the health reasons and how a lot of folks in our indigenous community didn't deal with all the health issues that you see low income communities of color deal with nowadays. Um, and so a lot of that attributes to like the meat, the dairy, the oil, like all the processed foods. Um, the fact that we, you know, eat street tacos on a super regular basis and eat, consume meat in a way that feels kind of imbalanced as opposed to like how our indigenous communities mm -hmm. ate meat because they still ate meat, right? Um, but it wasn't an everyday thing. It was more like ceremonial and, and purposeful, I would say. Um, and so I really think about it from that perspective, but I also do understand that with the colonization process, like our cuisine has evolved. So like, you know, as Pritin was like talking about authentic and traditional, like I always say that I like to challenge people on like what they think is traditional cuisine, because somebody might tell me that my pozole is not traditional because it doesn't have pork in it. Mm -hmm. And then I would challenge them back to think about the true essence of that dish and how long it's been prepared in Mexican indigenous communities before there was ever an introduction to pork, beef, or chicken. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the true tradition, right? But tradition evolves with time and with colonization that has evolved. Um, and so, you know, when you think about like, you know, cultural appropriation, that is tricky because, you know, Mexican cuisine has really, you know, transcended across so many different cultures like think of the world without chiles and tomatoes and vanilla and chocolate and corn and like all these things right um but then also we include things like cilantro and uh you know many other ingredients that are not native to this land so mm -hmm. you know and and that really shapes our food nowadays too so it's it's definitely tricky I think it's hard to be a, like to 100 percent live like a decolonial lifestyle in today's world right um because we we have evolved um but i think it's also important to give credit where credit's due too we also have a question from jen i'm curious where home cooking comes into this i often feel some kind of way about friends cooking food from my culture and then posting about it online as an accomplishment but they've never talked to me or my people about our culture and food and they use recipes that are written by white people. How do I confront that? And should I confront that? That's deep. That is. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, I mean, um, for me, it's like, if you're just cooking for yourself at home, for you and your family, cook whatever you want. Mm -hmm. I think the idea of appropriation comes in when you're getting some sort of personal gain from it. I think that's where we draw the line between like what's appropriation versus what's not. And, but if like you have a friend that's cooking all these other dishes from your own culture and you feel that they're somehow disrespecting it, then it's up to you to, you have the right to have that conversation with them. Yeah, I mean, I agree completely. Um, cook whatever you want at home for your friends and family. Um, I think that, yeah, the personal gain is the thing. And so it's like, if this person somehow is like really posting these things and getting all these followers and it's being, this person's able to like monetize this thing um, of cooking this food, then I think the conversation shifts. But like, I think that people should, and then, you know, if you're like, oh my God, my white friend is cooking the stew. 
<laughs> and, and gramming about it, then that's like another conversation about, you know, whether your values align or not um, and how big of a priority that is for you. Um, but like, you know, maybe it's something you're just like, whatever, anyway. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I feel like it's really about like those two things. It's like, first and foremost, like, you, cause you also mentioned like they're cooking food from your culture from white writers. Um, if that's a conversation you want to have, like, hey, I think it's great that you're showing an interest in Indian cuisine. Have you ever thought about, you know, reading these books or, you know, if you want to talk about it um, or something like that, maybe so that, you know, something positive um, and with momentum in a positive direction and not like shutting them down and being like, why are you cooking Alice in Romans do? Um, yeah. yeah, and there's that difference between appreciation and appropriation right mm -hmm. um so yeah you can appreciate things at home and try out different things um and then like like you know we're all saying just approach your friend and be like hey let me get you a book and like let's have a conversation and yeah we have a question that was in the chat that i realized um about i'll try to paraphrase of I'm a, a Colombian born and raised been in the US for 10 years and the chef owner of a virtual Mexican restaurant in DTLA. Um, am I supposed to cook Colombian food only because that's where I'm from? When is it okay to cook food from a different country? For example, Rick Davis taking up space. Why is his success harmful? Wouldn't it be a great challenge and goal to be as successful as he is? Right now, there are no famous Colombian chefs on Food Network, but if Bobby Flay were to show Colombian food before I become famous, I'd be super proud. Interesting. So the question yeah. here is, yeah. Yeah, why is, why is success helpful or success bad? Um, and what happens if you are a POC and want to cook something else? Yeah, I mean, I think going back to the things we voiced earlier, I think the biggest issue with that and the biggest issue that I had with Rick Bayless, like, like I mentioned, at, you know, at first glance and, and, and seeing his show growing up, obviously there is a level of like, oh, it's so cool to see through his lens, this cultural cuisine from different areas, diff different regional cuisines. That's great. Um, but the main issue is that this person is taking up space where, you know, these networks, the, this industry typically will see, you know, the one Colombian chef, the one Mexican chef, the one such and such chef from, you know, a certain cultural background. And then that's the one person that people latch onto um, where it should be somebody from that culture representing the culture. Um, I, I personally feel, and I'm sure a lot of other people feel that way. So it's not to say that, you know, I don't want Rick Bayless to succeed. That's not the issue here. The issue is, you know, is Rick Bayless taking up space where he shouldn't be taking up space and where he should really be passing the baton over to somebody who very well deserves to be there. Um, I actually was um, on a, a, a virtual event this past weekend and a friend of mine um, sent me a video of her little daughter who's like four years old watching me on this show cooking. And she was super entranced by me cooking and it just hit me really, really hard. It literally just stopped me um, to see this young girl who, when I see her, I see myself at that age, who was super entranced by Rick Bayless or who that was, I wasn't that young when he was around, but like, you know, but somebody of that nature, like on the show, like cooking, being inside of their house, like watching their every move, um, that I wish that person looked like me, <laughs> you know? Uh, I, I wish that they, like, there was just more, like, you know, resemblance, but also, like, more um, of this, like, like, if maybe his family wasn't Lainey and his wife that rarely ever came out, if it was, like, the abuelita and the tias and, like, this whole family, I'd be like, whoa, that looks just like my family, you know, here are my, here's my culture that's being uplifted in a way that you don't see and you still don't see to that extent. So we need to be on these platforms. Like the way that you're saying, like this person said Bobby Flay and Rick Bayless. And I can, I can list off like hands full more of like white chefs who are quote unquote celebrating cultural foods. 
but let me, you know, on the same hands list the POC chefs and I can probably use like one or two hands. So that's the issue is that it needs to be equal. It needs to be equal. There needs to be the same amount of hands of white chefs, the same amount of hands of POC chefs. That's the real root issue. I just yeah, want to answer. Sorry, go ahead, Aaron. I was just say like success in and of itself isn't bad. Like we, we're not saying you shouldn't be successful or no one should be successful. Um, but like my question back to this person would be, why is it that you're cooking Mexican food? Like why? Is why like to start there and then sort of go through the motions of like keep continuing asking yourself why is it something that you really appreciate and like you surrounded yourself in it and immersed yourself in it and learned a lot and I don't know what the reasons may be but like why is it that you want to cook this cuisine and sort of conversely like why is it that you don't want to cook your own cuisine because I'm not I think just to reiterate, I don't think any of us are saying like someone can't cook outside of their culture and profit from it in some way. But I think it's having the sort of awareness of what you're doing and how you're doing it and trying to do so in a way that's as least harmful as possible. Mm -hmm. For, well, let's see if we can do this question, maybe one more, but um, this is something that comes up a lot. This question is from another Jenny. Uh, what do you do about the fact that when people's expectations of um, the food that you're cooking or the food that is being consumed from a culture is supposed to be cheap? Great question. I mean, I, I saw um, David Chang talk about this in his Ugly Delicious show, right? Like. If you think about a dumpling versus a ravioli, like people would pay, you know, $30 at, fine di at a fine dining restaurant for like three raviolis and some sauce, but they would never pay $30 for three dumplings and some sauce, right? So yes, that is definitely a huge issue in that, you know, one thing that I, whenever I'm teaching classes and I talk to people about the process of nixtamalization of corn, and how tortillas should be so much more expensive than they are, right? Um, or just appreciated so much more than they are. Um, but people will not ever be willing to pay the price that it takes to eat like really delicious, true, like heirloom corn gone through that process that takes days and so much labor. Um, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, a <laughs> it's definitely a tricky subject. Yeah, I mean, I, I said to the East Bay Express the first year my restaurant opened that if anybody says it's overpriced, they're racist. Um, and they printed that, um, <laughs> much to the <laughs> chagrin of my wife. Um, <laughs> it's like, what, the, what did you do? It, it was fine. I live in Oakland. Um, some people came in and were like, I read that. I'm here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, I mean, I think that ultimately, like, yeah, what Jocelyn's saying is like, you know, I used to say this all the time, like people pay like, you know, $28 for six tortellini, um, but I give them like an entire like chicken leg with rice and all of these condiments and all these vegetables and, and you know, $24 is like too expensive. Um, so, I mean, I think that the, the short of it is like, it, it takes we just have to like know your value, you know? I mean, I just think that things should be, know their value. Like I wanted, I really wanted to have Gujarati samosas on my menu because they're different than Punjabi samosas and most people don't know them um, very well. Uh, but they're like super way more labor intensive. And, uh, but I was like, oh, but they're so delicious. Like Luke Sai said it was the best samosa he ever had. Like, we're gonna do this, we're, you know, here we go. Take back the samosa, um, but nobody would order it because in their heads, they're like, I know what a samosa is and meh, and I'm not gonna pay whatever, $7, $9 for like one samosa or two samosas. And so like the labor that went into what we were doing, it was like me and one other person would spend like four hours making like 40. Um, like it was ridiculous. I mean, I, I got faster, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also was trying to teach other people. So like, I wasn't the only one that could do it. Um, cause you know, I have other things to do running a business. Um, 
it was just, we just couldn't do it. We just had to take it off because it was just, you know, it just didn't work. And so I think that there's certain things within our cuisines that like, that's one example of like things that I'm just like, yeah, because I'm not going to do that unless I do it right. And people will just never understand the amount of labor that goes into that product. Um, we had a sev puri that had like nine ingredients on it, but it was just like one puri. Um, and every single thing was made by from scratch, including the puri. And like one of my, I never took that off the menu. People started to get it, but like my, one of my servers, like her s trick with it, because it, I think it was like nine bucks and it was like this one thing like this and just came up like that. And people would look at it like, oh my God, like I paid $9 for this little thing. And she was like, so what I do is I go to the table and I'm like, I go through every single layer <laughs> of what is in there. So they understand everything that's going to go into this, these few bites. Um, but I think, I mean, that's an, another way. Um, yeah. And I think part of it comes down to the value that society places on the labor of black and brown people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been historically undervalued where a couple hundred years ago, they were used to getting our labor for free. And now it's like, oh, I have to pay this person to work here? What? Mind blown. Um, <laughs> there's just a lot of education <laughs> in America that needs to happen about how much food actually costs like the act ingredients themselves, and then also how much it costs to make them. And like most things are severely underpriced. If we talk about like general business sense of like how much profit people should be making from a single item, et cetera. Uh, and so charge as much as you think you can <laughs> and charge even more than that, because I think Unfortunately, it's like we have to train people to sort of understand the value of things and how much something is actually worth. Like with the Pori's at Preeti's restaurant, like she had to sort of teach people. It's like, there's a lot here that you're getting. It takes a lot of labor. <laughs> it takes a lot of ingredients. It takes a lot of time to make each of those individual components. So it's somewhat they're like restaurateur, the restaurant's job to sort of educate their diners on that. Well, we are officially just two minutes over time. So I want to wrap this up and say a humongous thank you to our wonderful panelists. Thank you for all of your amazing thoughts. All of like, this was a really great conversation. Um, I know there's questions that we did not answer and I'm sorry, but I think we could talk about this for many more hours and days, probably years and not totally get to the end of it. So we will be sending out an email to everyone who signed up with all the information so you can see more about the panelists, follow their work, support their work. Um, and we'll also send along some readings and things that we found useful on appropriation. There was a question about that as well. Outlets, videos, places to learn more about it. We'll send that out as well. Um, but please like keep engaging. We'll have more conversations about appropriation in various types of industries. Maybe we'll do another one on food. And please reach out to the panelists if you do have questions and hire them to consult and pay them for their labor. So with that, um, I'll bid everyone good evening or good afternoon, wherever you are. And thank you all for being here. I'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.